Uh, yeah, just go ahead. Awesome. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emma Renskill. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford University, and I'll be doing the batch offline RL tutorial. Um, and that will be um, both for this hour and for the next hour. So I think um, I think it's often helpful to know where people are coming from in terms of the presenters that you're going to hear from. Um, and I've been, you know, I think one of the reasons why we're so excited to have the reinforcement learning session right now is just the extraordinary um, benefits that we've been seeing. Let me just see if I can make that. Oh no, that didn't work. One sec. No, put that back. Mm, okay. Strange. Okay, I'm not sure why there's that extra thing at the top, but that's okay. Um, is there's just been some really extraordinary successes of using reinforcement learning um, uh, over the last five to 10 years in Atari and the amazing results for Go, et cetera. Um, but I'm a professor um, like many other people here or many people here and involved in academia. And I think when people ask me if reinforcement learning is solved or if we're done, I think about a challenge that many of us have to face every quarter, um, which is office hours. You've assigned a new homework assignment and then for the first um, office hours, you're gonna have a series of students coming in. And it's really this partially observable Markov decision process problem um, where you're trying to quickly figure out how to help each student re um, reach some understanding. Um, and you wanna quickly figure out strategies that help not just this student, but future students. You often have costs and budget constraints. Um, and we don't have any sort of reinforcement learning system that can handle this type of complexity. And so in my own work, the reason why I'm personally so excited about reinforcement learning is I think it not only that for any quest for sort of general artificial intelligence, we have to think about being able to quickly learn to make good robust decisions. But also because I think that if we can make progress on this, it's so core to being able to advance in the use of artificial intelligence for human benefit um, in things like education and healthcare um, and many other people facing applications. And the really exciting thing to me as a researcher is that as we try to tackle those applications, it also introduces all these really beautiful theoretical questions that we don't know the answers to. And so I think really in my own lab, it can be summarized by sort of a deceptively simple question, which is most of the time we think about how do we learn from limited samples to robustly make good decisions. And when we try to formalize how to do this, this naturally invokes um, a huge number of theoretical challenges. Now, um, of course, you've seen this sort of slide many times now in terms of reinforcement learning. I just want to be clear about some notation I'll be using actions to devote A to devote A to denote actions, S, which will frequently be a continuous vector, but not always. And I'll try to be clear if I'm ever thinking about the tabular setting. Um, but most of the time today, I'll be thinking about actions being discrete. So this will normally be discrete. So normally discrete for most of the time the problems that I'm thinking about today. S will normally be sort of continuous often vectored. Um, and then we have some reward signal. And as usual, we're gonna, so even though I've written um, a sum there over S prime, generally we're gonna be thinking about S prime as being an integral over next states we might reach. Um, and as usual, we don't know the dynamics or the reward model. Now I've written down here sort of the standard Markov decision process approach, but we'll also get into that further about whether we're considering that or other settings. And what the focus of this tutorial is, is on there, there's sort of a, a many different terms for it, but um, counterfactual or batch RL. Um, this is also often called offline RL. Um, I'm gonna try not to use off policy too much because that can often refer to online as well. But really the setting we're considering here is that we have some data set of past data, and I'm gonna think about those as being trajectories. So sequences of state, action, reward, next states. Um, and that we're gonna assume for now that those are all generated by a particular behavior policy. Um, we'll get into later whether or not we know what pi b is or not, um, and we can often extend these ideas to when there's multiple pi b's, but essentially the idea is that we're not going to be tackling exploration at all um, in this tutorial. The idea is that all the data has been previously collected, and whatever we're going to do with respect to um, uh, that data, that, that's all that we have access to. And so the outline for the tutorial today is to first talk about sort of 
the general setting, the tasks, the assumptions, the type of objectives that we might want to solve when we think about offline or batch reinforcement learning, and why I think it's one of the most exciting problems um, right now in the field. Um, and then talk about two of the two of the most common tasks, offline batch evaluation and offline batch learning and optimization, and then highlight some of the recent additional directions, um, either in terms of relaxing assumptions or new types of objectives that I think are particularly promising. So um, the, the question really that batch reinforcement learning tries to get at um, is this what if reasoning given past data. So consider the following scenario where we have um, electronic medical record systems, where for each individual, um, we see a series of um, treatments or interactions with that individual. So maybe we um, prescribed some medicine and then they had a doctor's appointment and we saw some outcome about their health um, with a, which was had a score of 92. And then maybe for a second individual, they um, were prescribed two different types of medications over time and um, eventually their outcome was 91. And the idea is that we'd have a whole sequence of these. And, and the key question really is, what do we do for a new individual? Um, and this is a really challenging problem for, for many different reasons. And it's fundamentally different than supervised learning for those of you who are sort of come from uh, that background. And the first question the challenge is that data is censored. So we just can't know what would, it, would have happened for a particular individual, um, in this case, the top individual, um, if for this woman we had, um, say, given them a different sequence of uh, treatments or um, actions, essentially. And so we can only live one life. We, we don't know, you don't know right now how much better your life would be if you were drinking coffee outside, um, you get to experience this particular trajectory. And so data is fundamentally censored. So that's one reason why this is really a hard problem. And this is a problem that comes up in single time step decisions too in the bandit setting. The other thing that I think is particularly important when we think about um, reinforcement learning and where we're making not one decision for an individual but a sequence of decisions um, is the need for generalization. So if we think about here, here I've shown you just sort of a, um, a two time step decision process. Um, the, the number of different actions we could see here generally um, you know, grows combinatorially with the horizon. Of course, we can use state and other things to try to reduce that. But in general, there's just gonna be an enormous number of different strategies um, and orderings of different actions and interventions. And we're just not, it's not gonna be feasible to use the standard scientific process of a randomized control trial to consider every different possible sequence. And so it would be really nice if we can to do some form of generalization so that we confer, can infer that even though maybe we've never tried starting with a checkup and then prescribing a medication for this particular um, condition, that based on the previous data we've seen, um, under certain assumptions, we may be able to interpolate or extrapolate to predict how good this sort of never before experienced future will be. I think it's a, a pretty amazing time for, for thinking about these types of problems. Um, Generally, I think in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's just growing interest in this area of causal inference and machine learning, um, not just for decision-making, but even for building predictive models that we think will generalize better in terms of being able to capture some underlying structure um, about the world. But um, there's also, but I think it's also important to note that sort of historically, even though this this type of area has a long history. Um, there's, there's a lot of prior work in things like statistics and biostatistics um, and economics, that a lot of this work is really focused on this question of a single binary decision. So we might wanna do something like treatment effect estimation, where we think about what would be the expected treatment effect um, maybe conditioned on a particular individual compared to a control. And so there's an enormous body of, of research on this going back decades. Um, but really that's from an RL perspective that's considering the bandit problem with two actions. Um, and I think when we think about sort of the RL perspective, there's an enormous number of problems where we're not just making one decision, but we're making many, many decisions. Um, and the problem with that is that we have to really deal with this challenge of covariate shift. So what do I mean by covariate shift? Um, uh, so um, 
I got a quick question, which is, you know, what does make a uh, causal inference closer to batch offline RL than say supervised learning? I'll actually defer that. I'm not an expert in causal inference. That field itself is, is super vast. Um, I think what I'm trying to highlight here is that for the aspects of causal and counterfactual reasoning, where people are thinking about this to try to make decisions in the future, um, I think that that community, there's a lot of strong relationships between that and what people are thinking about in the reinforcement learning community. And there was a nice set of of, um, there's a nice uh, workshop, I think it was in ICML 2018, where they tried to get people together who come from more of like the Judeo Pearl tradition um, with reinforcement learning experts. Thanks for the question. So the challenge when we think about doing this for reinforcement learning, where we're making not just a single decision, but many decisions is covariate shift. So Fundamentally, if we want to think about how it might be to make a different sequence of decisions or have a different decision policy, by definition, for this decision policy to be different than our behavior policy that we used to make decisions in the past, that means for at least some states, we have to take different actions. Um, and in general, those different actions will lead to different state distributions often by intention. We, we would like that to happen because we um, want to say have more patients have good outcomes. So I, I really like this figure um, by my colleagues, Finale Dashi Velez and David Sontag and a number of their wonderful students, um, where, where what they thought about to sort of illustrate this problem is imagine you have a bunch of electronic medical record systems, uh, medical record data, and you look at these patients and you say, well, in my this is just historical data. You could think of each of those dots as being a patient. And what you want to know is whether or not, if you have a decision policy that applies mechanical ventilation, you know, how well will they, they do? So you follow that first line down. And then you say, okay, well, so now under my policy, if these people experience discomfort, I'm going to apply sedation. And what you can see in each stage here is that the number of patients who happen to have received the decision policy that you're prescribing is going down and down. Um, and in some ways, you know, depending on your behavior policy, this will happen very naturally. And so what this means is that over time, sort of you can end up with a very small number of individuals that got the particular treatment policy that you want to evaluate. And that can cause lots of challenges in terms of variance. Um, and there's lots of different ways to handle that that we'll try to get into some of today. I also want to highlight that from a, a theoretical pers uh, perspective, the challenge of sort of this covariate shift and the difference between the data that you have in your database, essentially, from the behavior policy and the data that you expect to see in the future has been noted even for imitation learning. Um, and there's a uh, nice sort of prior theoretical results, including by Ross and Bagnell and Peter Abiel's group and others have thought about this as well, to show how badly these errors, um, say in prediction or, or other um, aspects, can compound over time due to these covariate shifts. Now, I'm gonna to talk today about um, the setting where you have a fixed amount of prior data, but I wanna highlight that this question of taking existing data and using it to evaluate um, alternative policies or trying to extract a better policy um, has an enormous history. Um, and this idea of off-policy reinforcement learning really goes you know, all the way back to Q-learning. So it has a, a history of at least 30 years. And this has been really extensively studied over time, and, and there's been lots of known challenges uh, to doing this from the reinforcement learning community, including sort of the, the deadly triad of function approximation and off-policy learning um, and doing this kind of dynamic programming. But what I want to highlight is sort of how people have tried to tackle this, um, has focused on particular different types of objective functions, particularly when we are doing this not for the um, uh, the batch setting, but in the case where we get continuing data. So I think there's this really nice figure from uh, Rich Sutton and Andy Barto in um, their recent updated textbook, where what they do is they sort of say, well, imagine that we have like some subspace of what value functions um, that are representable uh, by some set of parameters. Um, and what we could think about in this case is that whenever you do a Bellman backup, you may kind of be projected out of that space. So um, it may be that the resulting value function cannot be represented in your original space. And so we can think about sort of how do we constrain this or what type of error might occur in a lot of different ways. And one of the column, column, uh, common ones to think about is projected Bellman error. And so that looks at if you then project back down into your space, so your backed up value function can no longer be represented in your original space and now you're gonna project it back down. Um, 
then what is the distance? Um, because we know that under the, the Bellman equation, that if you're at the optimal policy, um, then you're at a fixed point. And so one of the common objectives in this case is to look at the projected Bellman error. And, and there's been a lot of you know, interesting work on that. Um, uh, let me just pause for a second. So there's a question that said, um, by covariate shift problem, are we meaning that the number of samples of the policy we want to evaluate is small? Um, great question. I think what we mean generally is the covariate shift problem is that the distributions of, of states and actions that we have in our data set under one behavior policy is not the same distribution of states and actions as what we expect to see under either say an optimal policy or the policy we're evaluating. Um, uh, and that's the covariate shift problem. So in comparison to supervised learning, where we normally assume that the, the data distribution is IID um, and will be the same in our, uh, in our training set, in our test set, that that is no longer the case in BACTRL. So this is the common objective, or this is one of the common objectives. And I think in many problems, including some of the places we've had really wonderful successes um, uh, in things like robotics and, and video games, et cetera, a lot of these types of objectives have worked really well. But I think one of the really big exciting things to me is, well, what if we aren't in the case where we can continue to get data easily? So we're really in this batch, you know, offline setting, data is fixed. Um, and then how, you know, is this the right objective we want to think about? So I put up here two particular examples. One, I think healthcare is a case where often it's hard to do exploration and it's hard to do online RL. Um, and another is a, a, a tutoring system um, that's made by War Child, which is a nonprofit that helps kids in conflict regions. And we've been collaborating with them, looking at um, trying to introduce some amount of personalization in some of their educational software. And for them, um, for example, in Uganda, they can deploy the software in, uh, on these uh, tablets, and then they'll get them back a month later. You just can't, you don't have real time data collection. You don't have real time. Um, ability to change the policy online. So I think there's many cases where it's just not reasonable to assume that we're going to be able to get online data all the time. But it really matters. These are high stakes cases. Um, you know, this is kids learning, this is um, uh, people's treatments, and um, we would like to see if we can do better with them right now, but we would really like to do that in a way where we have some sort of assurances about the policies we do. And so I think for there, it's great to think about this other objective, which has been less studied historically, um, I think, in, in the reinforcement learning community, but I think is really critical to think about when we want to start moving to these other settings, which is value error. And again, this is still in Sutton and Bardo's textbook. And what this says is, let's think about doing, say, a series of Bellman backups. Um, maybe you're not in the space. Ultimately, you have some value of the policy you care about. And then you have maybe some error between that and what you're estimating. And we would like that to be small. And I think that um, I've been really interested in that sort of objective of saying like, you know, how, what is the error in, in the prediction between how good we think a decision policy will be based on this uh, historical data versus its actual performance. And I think um, for those of you that had the chance to see Anka Dragon's wonderful talk yesterday, I think this really is um, a great chance to think about, um, and a tutorial is a great chance to think about, you know, what are the problems we're trying to solve and which of those do we each pick uh, as the ones we think are most important. And I think in particular, the, there's been a huge amount of recent work um, in off-policy RL and there's growing work in batch RL, which is super exciting. And a lot of these different approaches come from sort of very different motivations in terms of the type of assumptions they make and the type of evaluation criteria they're trying to achieve, um, their definitions of success. And so I think um, I'll of course be able to share my own views about some of the ones I find particularly exciting in terms of um, evaluation criteria, but I think it's really helpful to think about kind of this cube of different um, uh, spots that we can get into to uh, compare different types of approaches. So in particular, what type of tasks are common? Well, I think um, there are two common types of tasks. One is off policy or offline evaluation. So this is a single policy. So um, for example, it might be that there's some, uh, you have some historical data and you think that there might be a new way to um, treat blood pressure and you'd like to see based on the historical data, maybe a different sequence of how to treat blood pressure or a different dosage scheme, um, which has been tried a little bit in the past, but maybe not completely. Can we estimate from the historical data how good that is? And I'll try, sometimes I'll, I'll drop it for um, uh, sort of 
convenience, but um, and reducing um, notation overload. But I'll try to often put in D here to indicate that this estimate that we have of the value of a policy is really a function of the input data. So this is one very, very common task um, that we would like to be able to do. And then the other is um, optimization or learning, which is often we don't care about just you know, knowing how good a particular policy is, what we really want to do is to be able to find a good policy to deploy in the future. Um, and we may want to also know what the value is of that particular policy. So those are, I would argue, the two most common tasks, and that's where the majority of the literature has been focused. Um, but I'll try to highlight it again at, at the end, a couple different tasks um, that are common. And I'll, I will say too, you know, in two hours, I can't possibly, unfortunately, do justice to the full um, amount of work that's been in this space. So I'll just try to kind of give a highlight of different ways that I think of, that we can kind of categorize these types of approaches and give us senses of some of the exciting open areas to make progress on in the future. So Emma, there's a question on Discord about uh, sort of independence assumptions, like what, what are we going to assume? I guess within a trajectory, you obviously have dependence because there's a policy. Uh, but if you could just comment on sort of the independence assumptions. Yeah, that's a great question. And it'll be, it, dep it depends on, on the work. Some people assume that there is um, a stationary distribution over states and actions that is induced by a behavior policy and that we get to sample randomly from that. Um, other people assume that the data might have been generated from, for example, a reinforcement learning system or something like that, where then your behavior policy is not constant, it's changing over time. Most of the work, I think, assumes that you have a fixed behavior policy and then you generate trajectories from that policy where each time you get to sample from an initial starting state distribution, which may or may not be known, and then you generate um, policies from that. So the, the second thing that I think is incredibly important and um, I'll try to go into a bit more later is what are we assuming? <laughs> what are we assuming for, for our algorithms and particularly for our theory? Um, uh, but it's, it's really important for our algorithms as well. And I, I'm highlighting here some of the, the common assumptions that we make. Um, one that is often not even stated, but I think there's been some really cool recent work from um, Chelsea Finn's group and also Phil Thomas's um, uh, that is trying to relax some of this, at least in the online case, which is most of the time we're assuming that we're sort of fundamentally in a stationary process. So that there's some Markov decision process or POMDP in the world, there's some decision process, stochastic decision process, and it's fixed. And then um, we have some prior data from acting in that decision process, probably for with a behavior policy, and that generated some data. And then we're going to compute um, a new policy to maybe deploy in the future. Um, and the fundamental assumption is that we're acting in the same decision process as before. So the world hasn't changed. There's no pandemic. Um, uh, and you could relax some of these uh, and try to think about sort of separate sources of distribution shift due to the fact that your decision process itself has changed. But as a default, um, almost all of the work assumes that the fundamentally you're in some decision process and that is going to be the same for the data you've collected and the future. The second is the Markov assumption. Um, this is certainly not always made and I'll, I'll try to highlight this later. Um, it's a common assumption to make and it can give us a lot of benefit when it's true um, in terms of statistical efficiency um, and certainly empirical performance. But this is one where I would say, you know, I mean, half is a gross generalization, but a certain, you know, a lot of people make this, a lot of papers make this assumption, a lot of papers specifically do not. A third assumption, um, which again is, I think, even more common than Markov, substantially more, which is almost all of the prior literature that would come from sort of an RL lens would assume sequential ignorability, um, or it, it might be called the no confounding assumption. And the key assumption there is that you have access to all the, the variables and all of the state information that was used to make the decisions. Um, and I've put this here and um, this is potential outcome notation, which I'm not gonna go into much today. That comes more from like the statistics and um, econometrics communities. Um, but the, the key idea here is that um, there is not an additional hidden confounder, um, which is influencing um, the behavior choices. And, and I'll, I'll talk more later about um, places that, that, that might not be a, a good assumption. And then the fourth one, which um, I think is again, very common, um, and there's been new work on this that I'll talk about more at the end, is an overlap assumption. And this is also very important. And the, the sort of basic assumption this makes is, let's say that you have some pi e, so some evaluation policy, 
that you're curious about. And then there's some pi b, which is used your, it's gonna be called behavior policy. This was used to gather the data. Um, and, and this could be like pi, I'll try to generally use pi or pi e. Um, and you could imagine that under your pi b that induces some uh, distribution over your states and actions. This could be stationary or it could be per time step. And then you have an evaluation policy that would also induce a distribution over states and actions. And the key assumption of overlap is that any um, state action tuple for which you would have non-zero probability under the policy you're curious about has to also have non-zero probability under your behavior policy. In some ways, this is very intuitive. You know, if you have um, never tried driving to the airport and you've only ever taken the subway, um, uh, then there's no prior data that you would have to be able to estimate how good it would be to drive the car to the airport. This is sort of saying, you know, we can think of this as a coverage assumption. Um, I, some of these assumptions are not made explicitly in some papers, but I think that it's really helpful to be explicit about them um, without, you know, too much unnecessary formality because I think that they're often critical to the types of um, results that we would hope to be able to see, even empirically. So those are common assumptions. The, the last thing, the sort of last important part of this cube to me is, um, uh, you know, what are we trying to do? You know, how would we, how do we compare algorithms and um, uh, what are the evaluation criteria? And ah, so somebody asked, what is mu? Mu here is um, the distribution of states and actions that we would expect to observe either per time step or in a stationary chain um, under the behavior policy. Mu E would be the ones we would expect to see under our um, policy we're curious about, possibly an optimal policy. So this question of, um, you know, what is our evaluation criteria or what is um, sort of the success metric we're considering, I think is really important. Um, and I think in general in RL, we've seen very different approaches in RL depending on which aspects of these people consider most important. So one thing um, that I'm not gonna talk too much about today, but I think is a, you know, a very important consideration, particularly if you do have the option of getting more data, if you can kind of trade between, um, if computation is kind of the same as data collection, which it can be in simulators, um, then computational efficiency can be really important. And a number of um, papers are really focused on that. And it's also can be very important in terms of just allowing us to tackle the size of the problems that we want to. So I don't want to diminish computational efficiency, um, but it's not, I'm going to mostly not focus on that today. I'm going to mostly assume that because the data set is fixed and often um, the cases we're thinking about are more high stakes, that it is more important to be statistically efficient and um, to sort of leverage additional computational resources, particularly for in the case that we're gonna sort of pick a single policy and then deploy it for a long time. So we can maybe afford to spend a lot of computational effort to decide what new way we're gonna sort of roll out for maybe a new medical treatment. Um, and I'm happy to discuss um, other people's opinions about you know, which choices they think are most important in terms of the evaluation criteria. The second one is performance accuracy. Um, the first way I've written this down is essentially um, empirical mean squared error. So what you can imagine in these cases is that, um, and I haven't sort of, prim I'll put an I here too. So imagine that you have a bunch of different data sets. Um, this is just like your empirical benchmark domains, for example. So maybe M1 is, you know, um, half cheetah, um, M2 is cart pole, et cetera. So you have a series of um, benchmark domains, such as uh, D4RL, which Sergey Levine and other colleagues from, I believe, um, Berkeley as well as Google put out. And so you have these benchmark domains, you have data sets from each of these benchmark domains, you have particular policies that you're interested in evaluating or learning. And then what you do is you evaluate your performance on that set of benchmark domains. So that's what I mean by the first. And so this is sort of an empirical version of um, accuracy for your method. The second is consistency. Um, so that we want to know that in the limit as the data set goes to infinity, um, that, that our estimate of the value of the policy is converging to the true value of the policy. And then the third would be something like finite sample guarantees, where we get um, bounds that are as a function of the data set size um, uh, about how good our estimate is. And, and there's related other things like sort of confidence interval as, um, and also regret guarantees. So 
the regret guarantees tend to talk about how good is our resulting policy compared to the best policy. Um, and that comes in when we start to think about optimization. Okay. So there's a question on Discord saying, is it common to search only over the space of stationary policies? Oh, um, is it common to vote? To vote uh, good question. Um, is it common to search only under the space of stationary policies? Pretty, yeah. I mean, I don't think that um, there's sort of off the shelf methods for doing, um, I, I don't think the fields converge, but I think most of the time people focus on stationary policies. I mean, it depends on the setting. If you're in sort of uh, episodic settings, you may want to think about, you know, incorporating the, incorporating the time step. So I've sort of summarized, um, you know, the different two tasks, the off-policy um, evaluation, off-policy optimization, some of the important assumptions that people either make or don't make, um, and some of the forms of evaluation criteria that people use. Um, I think I had a question here about what row is. Thank you, I didn't define that. Row is generally the starting state distribution. So we'll assume that we start from a start state distribution. And we'll, um, ah, another question, which is, you know, how would we compute uh, what V is? You don't know what the true V is. Um, in, uh, in benchmark domains, you know what the true value of the policy is because you can do Monte Carlo rollouts. And so that provides a ground truth that you can use for empirical analysis. For these other approaches, then we have to use theory to prove that we're actually gonna converge to the optimal, optimal value or what the finite sample bounds will be. Uh, the last question I didn't quite understand about what it means for the how quickly the policy is learning, but feel free to clarify that. This is all in the offline case, um, but the finite sample guarantees give us a sense of how quickly the estimate is converging to the true value. And the regret bounds that I'll talk briefly about later give us also a sense of how good we are doing as a, a function of the amount of data we receive. Great, so this sort of gives us a sort of a landscape, I think, for thinking about how to um, uh, compare and contrast different types of methods. Because um, uh, as I said, the, this field is really vast, which is super exciting. And I think even, you know, in the la I had the pleasure of um, uh, emailing with several different colleagues um, over the last week or two to ask people, you know, some of their favorite recent papers. Um, and I think even this summer, there's been a, a large number of additional work. So it, it's a super exciting time to be thinking about this. So let me start with batch policy optimization, um, or let me actually start with um, policy evaluation. So this is gonna be this question of, um, someone gives us a policy, this is given. You know, we wanna know some particular slight change in maybe the order in which we're gonna give vasopressors versus something else. Um, and then we wanna figure out how good that is. We wanna get an estimate of um, its performance. And the performance I've put here is just sort of an average over all possible initial starting states that we would expect to get. Um, this can be weighed to different um, uh, starting state distributions. Um, and you can also do conditional average treatment effects or, or try to get these estimates for individuals based on the initial starting state. So what are the types of methods that people use to try to do this offline or batch of policy evaluation? Well, the first two are probably extremely familiar because they're the standard things we do for online learning, uh, online RL, um, which is model-based and model-free. And then the third and fourth may or may not be as familiar. So the first sort of simple thing you can imagine doing is you have a collection of data. Um, you, didn't get a, you didn't get to choose how to collect it, um, but you have some data. And so you just take that data and you learn models. So we're just going to, these are all our estimated models. And if you're in the estimated one, if you're in the tabular model, tabular setting, which I'm gonna generally assume we're not, but if you're in the tabular setting, then it's just counting. You just average, you know, your reward in each of the state action pairs. You look at your um, uh, multinomial over the next states, you count, you average. And then you can do policy evaluation analytically um, because it's just a, a very simple, straightforward uh, policy evaluation uh, with a finite set of states and actions. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and you can do much more complicated things than that. You could fit deep neural networks to try to build reward models and, um, uh, and dynamics models. Um, and, and all of this is gonna give us sort of um, different ways to get some model out um, uh, that then we can treat as if it's a simulator of the world. And once you have a simulator of the world, you can 
you know, do online RL on that. You can do planning, um, anything you want to try to evaluate how good this particular policy is. So one is to sort of try to map it back to as if we know what, what the dynamics model and the reward model is. Um, and I'll talk more about uh, models later. Right now, remember, we're just in the case where we're given a policy. So that's input. And so we're just trying to evaluate it. Um, one thing I want to highlight is that how we fit the model, even in these cases, matters. So the method I just proposed here, would, um, and most of these sort of, um, ones have typically fought, focused on maximum likelihood estimation of the models. Uh, but because of this sort of covariate shift problem that we talked about, that may not be the best thing to do, because you could imagine that if you're previous policy spends a lot of time in states and actions that you don't expect to see as much under your target policy or evaluation policy, then your sort of representational power may be being spent to the detriment of some parts of the state space, um, which you actually want to model a lot better because you're going to visit those. And so um, I would just want to highlight that we've observed that before. And so we, in um, some work led by my grad student Yao Lu and um, in collaboration with Omar Gotsman and uh, Penali Joshi Velez, we were really curious about if we change the loss function for building models um, to focus on the fact that we're going to have this sort of covariate shift and we're going to have this different data distribution. Um, can we can we get better models that we can then use to do better policy evaluation? Um, and what you're seeing in this case is for one of our healthcare examples, this is a simulator. Um, you can see that the green is the ground truth. Um, Orange here is the data, the, this is the sort of simulated trajectories you would get if the way you had fit your prior data was by maximizing the likelihood of your behavior data. And what you can see is that if you use our alternative loss function here, you get the, the blue, which almost overlaps with the green, not everywhere, but mostly. And so you can see that the types of models that you fit can be very different if what you're planning to do is to do a policy evaluation of a different policy. And in general, I think this question of, you know, what representations should we build and what models should we build if we don't just care about predictive accuracy, but we care about either predictive accuracy of a different distribution of data or to make future decisions um, and how that's different than the sort of standard uh, losses we use for predictive accuracy. I think that's a, a super interesting question um, that I think there's still a lot to be done. Okay, so that's, you know, one of the first things we could do. We could do um, model-based approaches. Um, another thing we could do is model free value function approximation. This has also been done for a long time. Um, this looks kind of like Q learning, uh, but now we're gonna we're not gonna be doing a, a max over actions. So we would just um, parameterize a Q function with a set of parameters. It could be a deep neural network, it could be linear, etc. Um, and Good, thank you for the question um, about um, sequential ignorability versus partial observability. Um, I will come back to that. There's certainly connections. Um, one of the key questions is whether you assume the process is actually identifiable or not, um, or if the, or if the um, confounding may be more complicated. But if I don't, if I don't answer it at the end, let me know. Uh, so in model free value function approximation, um, you know, like Q-learning, et cetera, um, except for, for a fixed policy, there's many different styles of approaches. This, there's decades of research on this, very, very popular for the online case, also very useful for the offline case. Um, I want to highlight that there's been some nice, there's been sort of a series of nice papers to try to analyze this case more for the optimization case than for the evaluation. But um, uh, there's a recent-ish paper from Lee Balashan and Yu where they do do just fitted Q evaluation, which we can just think of as being Q learning function approximation Q learning with a fixed policy. And um, so you get a generalization error of something like the following, which is after K iterations of fitted Q evaluation for this many samples, um, then I may get that wrong, it might be trajectories, but samples trajectories, then you have with high probability um, this difference. So you have the sort of the difference between your estimated value of the policy versus the true value of the policy scales is the following, okay? So I just wanna um, highlight an important few things about this. So what are these different quantities? Cause I think it's useful to sort of be familiar with what are the standard different quantities on which these type of bounds rely. So gamma here is our normal discount factor. Um, remember K here is the iterations. Um, what's D pi F? D pi F here is essentially, um, 
how well can we do um, a Bellman backup or a fixed policy? And how well can we represent that in the, um, the function spaces we have access to? And so this is, this is interesting because it's not just about realizability. It's not just about whether or not your value function class can be represented in the function approximator you're using. It's about whether or not when you do a dynamic programming backup, um, you know, for a particular policy, whether or not then that resulting object from like that graph that we saw before, whether that already is close to the original space. Um, and I think this is actually a super important point. So I'm just gonna see if I can go back to here. So that means, you know, when you go from here up to here, it might be that in fact, you didn't leave the space. And so that this gap here is very small. Um, and what this sort of gap here is telling us is like how big, you know, is this sort of projection gap when you go back down? Okay. Okay. So that's really important. That will not always be zero. But in many of the existing um, approaches, we assume it is zero or it's quite small. Why would we like this to be zero? Well, um, no, this is not um, this is not going to decrease as a function of um, n. So n here is telling us how much data we have, and then the error we get here, um, in terms of as a function of n, is appearing here. So we're gonna have some error that is gonna be getting smaller and smaller as we have more data. So sort of our statistical error is gonna be going down, so that's good. But then we have these additional terms which are not decreasing with the amount of data because they're sort of fundamentally about estimation error. The fact that we can't, um, when we do these backups, we're, we may be incurring a different additional error because we, when we, we need to project back into the space. Um, so either one needs to assume that those errors are zero in order to get things that would be asymptotically consistent, um, or you're gonna have sort of these constant errors that aren't gonna go away. So I, I just wanna highlight that. And you can think of those errors as just being um, uh, like function approximation errors. The other thing that I wanna highlight, and I'll go more into this later, um, is this term, okay? Which is, um, in this question of overlap is really important in terms of how much, how does the distribution of data that we reach under our behavior policy compare to the distribution of data we get under our evaluation policy. Um, and as they get further apart, as you might expect, it's harder to evaluate a new policy under your old policy. You can imagine, I'll just sort of draw pictorially, if the distributions your real distributions probably are not Gaussians, but if your distributions were Gaussian and you had a lot of overlap, then you would expect you think of this as mu b, and this is mu e over your states and actions. Then we, if we had a lot of overlap, then probably if you have a lot of data, you're gonna have a lot of ways to estimate. Um, let me put this out here. You'd have sort of sufficient data to estimate your, your target distribution. But if there's if they're like this, it's gonna be very hard, or if it's um, extremely little, um, if it's very unlikely to get data that overlaps a lot. So we'll go into that um, again more later. Um, it is not, there's a question whether or not we can think of beta as being um, a Kale distance. It isn't. I'm not gonna go into what the particular definition of concentration coefficient they use here because there's sort of another one um, that I think is a slightly different definition that we'll use for when we talk about some of the policy optimization criteria. So I'm gonna hold off on that now, but again, just ping me if it's not clear when we get to the next one. So this is just an example of the of a recent, pretty strong, I think the previous work may be scaled as um, epsilon to the fourth. This is only um, epsilon squared. Um, so a, a pretty nice result in terms of uh, a fitted Q evaluation theoretical guarantee. Okay, what is the problem with these methods, both the model-free methods um, of the value function or the or the models, uh, the dynamics uh, and the reward? Yeah, Chuba here. Uh... There was a question in the chat. Is uh, beta some sort of Kia distance? Uh, yeah, I think I just answered that. So, oh, yeah. Um, the, okay. yeah. Um, okay. But I, I think I said that it, it's not, and, and we're going to talk more about that assumption um, of what that sort of overlap and concentration coefficient means when we get to the optimization. But okay. definitely ask me again if, if it's not clear. So what is the problem with these methods? Um, so both the, the model-free methods and the, the model-based methods. Um, the problem is, is that um, they often have bias. So unless you assume that your value function um, really lives in the function approximation class that you've chosen, then 
then you're going to have bias in your resulting estimator. And often it requires actually not just this sort of realizability assumption, but additional um, assumptions. Though there's um, a really interesting recent paper that just came out, I think like a couple of weeks ago, which argues maybe we just need realizability. But, but in general, um, in general, we won't know whether or not like your function class actually captures um, the value function um, that you're trying to estimate, like for healthcare or something. It's hard to know if you're, um, two layer, you know, 16 node or much, much larger neural network um, is really approximating the true value function or not. So often there's bias. On the plus side, they're low variance. So they're often super data efficient, um, but they may just have asymptotic forms of sort of function approximation error or bias. So another approach is important sampling. Um, and I think these are, uh, most of you have probably seen this, but it's a really beautiful idea. So I just want to refresh us. So important sampling has this gorgeous idea, which says, let's think about the expected value of variable R, which we can think of for our purposes as being the reward under some distribution P. Well, imagine that we um, I want to think about what if we could only maybe sample from a different distribution. So what we can do here, so P here is our distribution. We can multiply and divide by Q of X, which is another distribution. And then we can approximate this with samples. So then if we imagine that X is just sampled from Q, then we get an unbiased, excuse me, estimator of um, the expectation of R under P by using samples that were um, sampled from Q. And the way that this is unbiased is that we reweight those samples by the ratio of um, the probability of those samples under the sampling distribution we care about, which is P divided by Q. So I think this is a really beautiful idea. I was talking to one of my former students from my class recently. He said this was his favorite idea from um, our RL class. So this is a beautiful idea. Noted only it does require overlap. Um, otherwise, this will not be an unbiased estimator. So this is requiring overlap. But it's this beautiful idea that we can use this behavior data under this sort of overlap assumption, and we can get this great unbiased estimator. Now this is just for sort of, um, I haven't talked to you about sequential data. So how does this work for reinforcement learning? So for reinforcement learning, we can think about sampling trajectories um, from our policy in a state. And imagine that we have both our behavior policy and our target policy. And so we can, again, do the same sort of important sampling trick. Um, and we can say, well, what if we um, only have trajectories from our behavior policy, um, then we can think about generating tricks for our behavior policy and reweighting them by the probability of seeing them under our target policy versus our behavior policy. Now, one natural question here is that we don't have access to the dynamics model. Um, so how do we compute this? But the beautiful thing is that then if we extend this out to write down what is the probability of a trajectory? Well, that's just the probability of the dynamics. And notice I've written a Markov form here, but this, this can be the full history. It doesn't have to be the markup assumption. The important sampling estimators here, this, is, this does not require, so this bias does not require Markov assumption. This is a very general form of estimator. Um, and the nice thing here is that uh, the dynamics of the world are the same, whether you're running the behavior policy or the reward policy, it's just that the way you're selecting actions is different. So this cancels and you don't need to know the dynamics model. And so we get an estimator here. And this idea, um, to my knowledge, was first um, introduced to the RL community um, by Precop Sutton and Singh back 20 years ago. Um, and it has been used, this invariance of this idea have been used for online reinforcement learning as well as offline and batch RL. Um, our group and many others have been thinking about how do you leverage these type of estimators. Okay. I wanna highlight that over the last couple of years, there's been also a different form of important sampling estimator that has been getting a lot of attention and had some really nice work. And this is um, a stationary important sampling estimator. Um, and if we go again, let's think about sort of what is the, the value of a policy? Well, we can think of one way of writing that is for all of the states and actions, um, this, you know, I used sort of mu for this before, so apologies. Um, but we could write it down as D, we could write it down as mu as what is the distribution of visiting those states and actions under this policy times what is the reward of that state and action? And that gives us the value of that particular policy. 
So again, imagine that we don't have access to mu pi of S A or, or D pi of S A. This is, we can think of this as sort of the stationary distribution. So you can extend this to per time step. Um, but let's think of it for right now in the sort of infinite horizon stationary distribution that we would get by running a single policy and getting a Markov chain. So then what we can do in this case is play the same important sampling trick, assuming coverage. So we have to sort of assume overlap. So we introduce it, introduce this, and then we can say, well, the value of a policy is just equal to, if I can sample states and actions, um, so these here are gonna be sampled from pi b from our data set. And then I'm gonna reweigh them by what is sort of um, uh, kind of the density, what would be um, the probability of me being in that state in action under my target evaluation policy divided by my um, behavior policy. And this is leveraging the Markov assumption. So this assumes the Markov structure. And my knowledge this was first um, sort of introduced as an idea in, at least in the RL community by um, Halleck and Menor in 2017. And then there's been a number of interesting follow-ups. I've just put a, a subset of them here. Um, empirically, it can often be very, very helpful um, because often important sampling, you have this product of um, ratios that can lead to extremely high variance as I'll talk about in a second. Um, but here we have to sort of estimate this ratio of densities, which itself can be quite computationally challenging. But there's been a number of works also sort of trying to focus on that problem for like empirically um, and other properties for, for large data sets. How can we get um, large problems? How can we get this sort of ratio? So may I ask a question related to this? What you just said, uh, it, it seems to me that uh... This is a, a form of wishful thinking here. Uh, it could be really, really uh, information theoretically difficult to estimate these uh, ratios or these densities and our, our distributions. And if we could do that, then we could maybe uh, do other things to estimate the values of, uh, of the policies. So whenever I see these papers, I'm really surprised. But as you say, they like, try to, uh, so some of the works are empirical and they try to do these approximations and then it seems to work, but I, do you know whether uh, it should work? Is there any reason to believe that it should work? <laughs> I think this is a great question and I, one of my students were debating whether or not um, fundamentally, I mean, if you can actually capture d pi of SA, at least if you know the reward, you know the value function exactly. So being able to estimate these stationary distributions and being able to estimate their ratio, um, I'm not aware, maybe somebody else, um, one of the other um, members or, or, or attendees, um, no, I don't know of any lower bounds or sort of formal hardness results of how hard it is to estimate either um, the stationary distribution, uh, stationary distribution ratio. And, and some of these works also depend on you know, do we know pi b explicitly or do we also have to estimate that from data? Um, it's just a form of density estimation mm -hmm. though, right? Uh, so the density it is. What's well, the ratio of density? Another, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not aware of any like hardness results. Um, I'm one of my students are, are curious about whether it, um, it fundamentally is, is, is equally hard as sort of the, how much this actually buys you. Though I think that leveraging the Markov structure certainly is helpful um, empirically. And I think that it's it helpful also in the model-based case. Where is the Markov assumption used? They're using the fact here that you're gonna have sort of these stationary chains. Oh, you're okay, but like, to the Markov just like some stationary distribution for some magical reason, not because of the Markov assumption, this would be just the expression that you could write. Yes, it's a good point. I think in this case, a lot of this line of work, I think of as um, the, not all of this line of work uses these ratios. There's other work, I'll, I'll talk in a second about doubly robust estimators. There's other work that takes a doubly robust estimation and tries to leverage the stationary distribution there too. And so to me, I think of this as sort of like important sampling estimators that leverage a Markov assumption. But I agree, there might be other assumptions that you could use as well. Okay. Let me see if I can just go a little yeah. further in this before we break for this. Um, so the nice thing is, you know, these give us this unbiased policy estimates, assuming the assumptions hold. Um, I just want to highlight that those unbiased policy estimates don't always lead to good policy selection. Um, 
essentially because we have different variances. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the different methods may have um, some of the different important sampling estimators, depending on how far your policy is from your behavior policy, can have systematically higher variance. And so if you start to use these unbiased estimators and take a max over those, unsurprisingly, then you can have systematic bias. Um, so we sort of have these two styles of approaches. We have these models, which have um, of either the value function or the dynamics and rewards, which have low variance, but often have bias. Um, and then we have important sampling, which under mild assumptions um, is unbiased, but they can have high variance because of the, it depends on these ratios. And so I guess one thing I'll just say, and then we can talk more about it after the break, is that um, a really natural idea is to combine between these two. Um, so that we have sort of these parametric or even non-parametric, but we have these estimators perhaps with high bias, but low variance. And then we have these other estimators that have high variance and low bias. Um, and while there's been a lot of empirical work, I think that the doubly robust framework is a really useful one to think about for how to kind of at least one really nice way to combine between these two. And this is, these doubly robust estimators have been very well known in statistics. These are things that I learned about, um, I don't know, maybe about five years ago. I think they're really beautiful. They were brought over to the machine learning community to my knowledge by sort of Miro Dudek and colleagues at MSR. Um, and then Nanjiang and Li Hong Li first brought these ideas over to RL, again, to my knowledge. Um, and the idea here is to say, well, let's kind of combine between these estimators. Um, so that we could have a value function estimator um, that in our case might be computed using a model estimator and doing planning, or it could be computed with model free estimators, but, um, but essentially you get a value function uh, of a policy you're curious about. And then you have, um, this here is just for the, um, the bandit setting, but you would have your reward received. Um, and then you'd have this model. And then you would include here um, the important sampling ratio. And what you can see here is if you then take an expectation over your policy, and I think one thing that I should mention here that's important is that most of the time here, we'll be thinking about stochastic policies when we're doing important sampling. So that means that this would have to be stochastic. And this is quite reasonable. If your behavior policy only ever takes one action in one state, you're, you're not gonna be able to interpolate um, what it would be like to take other actions unless you make other strong assumptions. But I think the nice thing here is you can see if you take sort of an expectation over this quantity um, uh, by the data collection you have, and I'll just rewrite this as pi b to be consistent with my other notation. So if you take sort of um, a sum over actions for pi b of a given s, you can see that you sort of recover um, the original important sampling estimator. And, um, and so we have this estimator that is unbiased and, and has some additional nice properties. So um, it, it has some really nice properties in particular, I'll just highlight this one before we pause. Um, it's consistent if either, um, let me see if it'll work highlighting, not right now. It's consistent if either the model is consistent or you can estimate the behavior policy consistently. One thing I haven't highlighted so far today is the fact that in many observational data sets, you don't explicitly have the behavior policy. We don't normally have for physicians, but you know, what is the probability they're gonna assign me aspirin um, versus Tylenol? Uh, so often that just has to be, that's sort of a latent um, to the data. And so often for important sampling estimators, we're gonna be estimating that in order to use important sampling estimators. And the estimator you have there might also be wrong. And so one of the nice aspects about doubly robust estimators is that they show that these are these type of resulting estimate of the value of a policy is consistent if either the model is consistent. So either if this you know, estimate the value function is consistent or you can estimate the behavior of policy consistently. And so it sort of gives us some nice assurances that the resulting estimators may be good. So I think I'll pause there um, and then I will pick it up uh, for the second uh, part of the talk um, at uh, two o'clock. Unmute, thanks. Thanks for the private talk. <laughs> <laughs> it does sometimes feel like that when one's talking to, well, <laughs> this time you were live, otherwise one just thinks it's the abyss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really thanks. Um, and we continue after the break. Uh, I need to grab the espresso. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>